Hey everybody, Pastor Matt here. Thank you so much for checking into our podcast at Gospel Fellowship PCA. Hey, what if I told you that there is a solid, biblical, doctrinally faithful, reformed church on a beautiful campus just a stone's throw north of Pittsburgh? Would you be interested? Well, let me tell you a little bit about it. We don't have lasers. We don't have a fog machine. We don't have an American Idol stage, but we do have the sweetest, kindest people in the whole world. We sing psalms and hymns, and we preach the Bible chapter by chapter. We love Jesus, and we're on a mission to share the good news of the gospel with the world. So would you be interested in coming to a church like that? If so, come check us out, Gospel Fellowship PCA in Valencia, Pennsylvania, and feel free to visit our website, gospelfellowshippca.org, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Gospel Fellowship PCA. Presbyterian Church. And now for today's message. Bibles, we're in Daniel chapter 10 today, starting a new chapter. Daniel chapter 10, we're going to read verses 1 through 9 together. So let's go ahead and stand up for the reading of God's Word as we acknowledge that God's Word is inspired. It is the inerrant and infallible Word of the true and living God, and so we regard it for what it is, the very Word of of the Lord himself. Daniel chapter 10, verses 1 to 9. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belshazzar. And the word was true, and it was a great conflict. And he understood the word and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meats or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for the full three weeks. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Uphaz around his waist. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. So I was left alone, and I saw this great vision, and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed, and I retained no strength. And then I heard the sound of his words, and as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in deep sleep with my face to the ground. May God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his holy word. Amen. You may be seated. Um, When we turn the corner in the book of Daniel from chapter 6, which is the narrative portion, to chapter 7 and following, which is the apocalyptic sections, I remember standing here warning you that this was going to be difficult for us in chapter 7 through 12 because there's a lot of very hard material here in the second half of the book of Daniel. Uh, Probably the hardest passage of all was last week that David very commendably taught us regarding the 70 weeks vision of Daniel. If you did not hear that sermon, I strongly recommend that you go back and hear what David did with that text. It was very helpful. That text, by the way, is not only the hardest text in the book of Daniel, but possibly one of the hardest passages in the entire Old Testament, and I would say maybe one of the hardest passages in the whole Bible. And so David did very well with that, so go back and listen to that message. Now, in today's text, we also have a difficulty that uh, is an interpretive difficulty for us that we're going to try to work through. I will tell you that today's text is easier than last week, no question about that. The applications, I think, are going to come across as clear as a bell for us today in this text. But nevertheless, we do have an interpretive difficulty here that we need to work through. And the interpretive difficulty is this. Who is this supernatural visitor that comes to speak to Daniel in the beginning of Daniel chapter 10? Now, I'm going to show you what some of the alternatives are, and we're going to consider that when we get there. But I just want to simply say that the meaning of this text is fairly obvious. The meaning of this text is that um, Daniel has encountered somebody here in a moment of his deepest distress and weakness that gives him encouragement in the very moments that he needs encouragement. That's the big E on the eye chart here. That's the meaning of this text, and we're going to go through it here 
and work through it step by step. So first, let me say, before we get into the main points here, a few things about the context here of this passage, because it actually really matters, the context here, the historical context matters. So grab out your Bible if you closed it, and let's look at the beginning, these couple of lines here, and especially in verse 1, where Daniel sets a stage for this incredible vision that he's going to see. So he says in verse 1, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belteshazzar, And the word was true, and it was a great conflict, and he understood the word and had understanding of the vision. Okay, so the beginning of chapter 10 here, this is actually one long extended vision that's going to take us all the way through 10, all the way through 11, all the way to the end of the book, okay? So 10, 11, and 12 are one piece of whole cloth here. They're one big block of wood. Everything left in this book is really this last visionary experience that Daniel has. And so although we have the chapter divisions and the verse numbers, just remember here that as a literary unit, this begins here in 10.1, and it's going to carry on to the end of the book, all right? Now, the dating sequence here, don't miss that. He says in verse 1, look, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. Now, pause right there. Cyrus, king of Persia, came into power in 539 BC. Why does that matter? It does matter. Why? It matters because that's the year that the Persians conquered the Babylonians, and Cyrus is the one who set the Jews free to return back to the promised land. That's massively significant. 539 BC is the year after 70 years of dreadful, terrible exile in which the Jewish faithful were dragged into essentially slavery in Babylon, right? When the Persians conquer the Babylonians and Cyrus takes power, Cyrus is the one who pronounces this emancipation decree. And so from that year on, the Jews are free to go back to the promised land. And you can read about that in their struggles For instance, in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah in particular, which I strongly encourage you do, because our text here today matches up with the goings-on in Ezra chapter 4. So you might want to read a little bit about that for some background. Now, that's interesting, though, because even as the Jews were set free to go back to the promised land in 539, notice that it's actually a couple years later, right? This is the third year of Cyrus. So, So the Jews have been set free to go back to the promised land for a couple of years now, But guess who's still in exile? Daniel. Okay. While his brothers and his fathers and uh, many others of the Jews are now either making pilgrimage back to the promised land or have already been made pilgrim back to the promised land, Daniel's stuck. He's still here. How do I know that? Because it says right here that he has this visionary experience when he's standing on the banks of the Tigris River. He has not gone back. And apparently, this is deeply distressful to Daniel. Now, we may ask, well, why didn't he go back? I don't know. It's possible that it's because of his aged condition. Remember, he's over 80 years old now at this point. Maybe he can't make the journey back. Maybe he's too weak. Maybe he's too feeble. Maybe Cyrus, right, whose government Daniel is now going to serve, wants to keep Daniel here, even though he's let the rest of the Jews go free back to the promised land. So that's a possibility, right? And not only that, but Daniel seems to be in a state of mourning and contrition here. Notice the fact that he's fasting, right? It says it in verse 2. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for three full weeks. Now hold up one second, okay? Because he also gives the dates of this particular vision. And what does he say? What does he say the date is? Do you see that? On the 24th day of the first month. Folks, that's just over the Passover. That's just past the Passover time. And if Daniel is lamenting his condition here, stuck in Babylon, while many have gone back, many are back in the promised land, and they've just celebrated Passover, and Daniel is still in exile, and he's not been able to celebrate the Passover, well, no wonder he feels alone, and distressed, and contrite, and filled with mourning, right? And so that's why, did you pick this up? Did you notice that in verse 1, he once again calls himself Belteshazzar, Daniel, who is called Belteshazzar. We've not heard that name for five chapters now. That's his exile name. That's his Babylonian name. That's what they called him against his will. And it's almost like here, 
that Daniel is resolved to the fact that he may never go back to the promised land. In fact, as far as I know, he doesn't. The end of the book ends a little bit ambiguously as to whatever happens to Daniel, but as far as we know, we do not have positive confirmation that he ever makes it back. And so one, no wonder here, this man who's been so strong, he's stood fast against these pagan rulers. He's interpreted their dreams. He's served them faithfully. He's preached against powers, against the powers that be. He stood fast in the lion's den. And now, so you can understand a little bit if, if he's going to break down just a little bit and show some weakness and some frailty here. And it's then, in this moment, And this weak moment that Daniel receives this visitation from this individual that, for lack of a better term, we're going to call today the supernatural visitor. Okay, that's what we're going to call him. He receives a visitation from this supernatural messenger. Now, here's our task this morning before we go to the Lord's Supper. Three things. First, we need to figure out, to the extent that we are able, who the supernatural visitor is. It's not easy. It's actually a good Bible mystery here, but we're going to try. Second, what happens when the supernatural visitor shows up? To what effect? To what result? We're going to look at that. And then third, I'm going to answer the perennial question, so what? What does that that matter to me, to you, to the rest of us? Okay, so who is it? What happens when he arrives? And what does that mean to you and I? Okay, so Bible's open. Let's do a little bit of work here to the extent that we're able. Look at verse 5, and let's see if we can identify who it is that is this supernatural visitor. Verse 5, I looked up, I lifted up my eyes, he says, and looked, and behold, a man, okay, that's interesting, clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Uphaz around his waist. His body was like beryl, his face, look at this, like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like a gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. Okay, so this is not any ordinary figure here. That's why I'm calling him the supernatural visitor. All right? But let's look at the details. First thing Daniel says about him, he calls him a man, a man clothed in linen. Hebrew word there, basic word, it's the word ish. It means, ready, man or person, or figure. It's a very common word. In fact, in the Hebrew, the word ish is used 1,768 times. That word alone is not remarkable. Okay? If that's all he said, I would think it was an average person just like you and I. But very clearly and very immediately, it's obvious this is not a common person here. Okay? This person, we might say, is shaped in a humanoid manner. Namely, there's a face, there's eyes, there's arms, there's legs, there's a waist. And so this person, we could understand him to be described as like a man. Obviously, it's a humanoid manifestation here, which is interesting in and of itself, given that sometimes angels are described as having animalian features, like in the book of Ezekiel chapter 1, a text that we're going to go to here in just a moment. But notice that these features, again, they're anything but ordinary. Linen is the garment of the priestly wear. His face is like lightning. His eyes are like flaming fire. His body is gleaming. And so this begs the question. And every theologian who deals with the book of Daniel has to answer this question. Who are we talking about here? Who is this? Okay. So let me give you the options. Some theologians say we're looking at Gabriel. Gabriel's already been mentioned in the book, but he's not been described like this. A lot of theologians, including solid Reformed theologians, say this is an angel. Okay, Hard to disagree with that. Other Reformed theologians, Matthew Henry in particular, as well as many of the other Puritans, actually hold, check this out, that this is a Christophany, which is a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. And there's strong biblical data to support that decision. We're going to look at some of that data here in just a moment. Um, Here are the categories. You have an epiphany, which is like a manifestation of something supernatural. That's the broadest category. More narrowly, you have a theophany, which is a manifestation of, of a visible appearance of God. And then very specifically, a Christophany would be an appearance of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, pre-incarnation. What do we have here? What do we have? Well, let's look at some of the data and why people like Joel Beakey, for instance, 
uh, believes that this is Christ that Daniel sees. Okay, so flip with me to a couple of passages here. First, the aforementioned text in Ezekiel chapter 1. This is very interesting here. Ezekiel chapter 1, flip back with me to this obvious theophany given in Ezekiel 1. We've looked at this text before a couple of times, but let's look at it again. Ezekiel 1 verse 26 is a theophany, classically described. Above the expanse over their heads, Ezekiel says, there was the likeness of a throne in appearance like sapphire, and seated above the likeness of a throne was the likeness of a human appearance. Okay, so we have something humanoid shaped. 27, and upward from what had the appearance of his waist, okay, we saw something of his waist in Daniel 10, as it were gleaming metal, there's another uh, theme there, like the appearance of fire, another layered commonality, and closed all around, and downward from his waist, he had the appearance of, I saw as it were, the appearance of fire, and there was brightness all around him, again, so there's another commonality, right? 28, like the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud on the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness all around. What are you describing, Ezekiel? Please tell us. And he does in the next verse. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And that's the word Yahweh, the covenantal name of God. And when I saw it, I fell on my face, same result that Daniel experiences, and I heard the voice of one speaking, and Daniel also hears a very loud voice. Okay, so there's a lot of layered commonality here between Ezekiel 1, obvious theophany, and Daniel 10. So now we're thinking this is God, right? Can't blame me if you do. Now, here's the clincher. Go with me to Revelation 1, and you're going to see even more commonality here in John's vision, which is definitely a appearance a vision of Christ. And we know this is Christ because this text is even more definite as to what's being described here. Revelation 1, verse 12, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on the turning I saw seven golden lampstands. Everybody's in Revelation 1, right? One twelve, Verse 13, And in the midst of the lampstand, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe, there's our linen that we saw in Daniel 10, with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes, okay, this is almost exact, were like the flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, same theme, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters, almost similar language there. In his right hand, he held seven stars. And from his mouth came seven, I'm sorry, a sharp two-edged sword. And his face, same theme here, was like the sun shining in full strength. Now, how do we know this is Christ in Revelation 1? How do we know? Well, look what he says next. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive. Obvious resurrection motif. Okay? So now I'm looking at Daniel 10, and I'm thinking with a pretty strong certainty that we're describing a pre-incarnate Christophany of Christ. And I've got oodles of reformers and Puritans to agree with me on that. But just for the sake of um, thinking this through, Calvin, Calvin thinks it's an angel. Or at least he doesn't go more specific in calling it an angel. What data would we have that might support that this figure is merely an angel and not Christ? Well, a couple of things. First, in Daniel chapter 10, our main text, when we get to next week's verse, and we did not read this far yet, in verse 13, this supernatural visitor says, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left with the kings of Persia. Well, that almost sounds as though he needs the help of Michael to overcome these demonic powers. So that's interesting. Okay, I guess we're going to have to deal with that next week. But then there's something else. And that is that, um, and I was almost sure that I was going to go with the Christophany interpretation until I looked at the Hebrew of Daniel, Daniel chapter 8, our main text today, and there's a couple of words that Daniel uses here that actually, actually have more in common with Ezekiel chapter 1's angels than the theophany. 
So remember, in Eagle, uh, uh, sorry, in Ezekiel chapter one, he also describes these angelic appearances as well before he gets to the theophany. And, and interestingly enough, there's quite a bit of overlap there in the Hebrew with this description of this visitor in Daniel 10 with the angels themselves in Ezekiel 1. So for instance, the word burnished or gleaming bronze is the word kalal. Okay? It's only used twice in the whole Bible. Ezekiel 1 and Daniel 10. And so I'm like, oh, it's a theophany. No, it's actually the angels are kalal. They're gleaming like burnished bronze. So that gave me pause. And in Ezekiel 1, the voice of many waters, or the loud voice, is actually the angels and not the theophany. So at least there's a little bit of data here that might support the angel interpretation too. And that makes me scratch my head and say, maybe Calvin, who's very careful in his interpretation, is actually onto something because, remember, one of Calvin's main interpretive ideas is that you never go beyond what the text actually says. That's hallmark Calvin interpretation. He never gets entrapped in sort of these fanciful interpretations that go beyond what the text explicitly says. And that, I think, is actually a pretty good principle when it comes to interpreting the Bible humbly, graciously, meekly. You do not want to be inventive or go beyond the text. Now, so where am I? I am going to boldly and courageously sit exactly on the fence on this. (laughs) Though I lean towards the Christophany interpretation, I really do, okay? But there's just enough pause here for me to say that it might be better, just with the principle of humility when we come to the Bible, to say that we should probably stick with our description that this is a supernatural visitor, okay? Because you can't go wrong either way there. So that's as far as I'm going to press this. Now, you can disagree with me, and you're free to do that. Plenty of data for the Christological interpretation, but there's also a good call here for humility when it comes to interpreting such texts. Okay, second. What happens when he shows up? This is our second main question. Well, you'll be surprised what happens when he shows up. Let's go ahead to verse 7. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. So I was left alone, and I saw this great vision, and no strength was left in me. Okay, so this is really interesting. There's a couple of responses here to the supernatural visitor. First, these men that are apparently with Daniel. Now, Daniel doesn't tell us who he's with. We don't know who these guys are, but apparently he was not alone when he initially began to see or to experience this vision. And what happens to these other observers is really quite remarkable, is that first of all, they begin to tremble. They get this sense that something is afoot. They get the sense that there's something divinely present to them. And so what do they do? They actually flee the scene. They take off. They bolt. They're scared. Okay? Now, this very much accords with what we sometimes call the mysterium tremendum. The mysterium tremendum is this feeling that you get when the hairs on your arms stick up and you're all of a sudden aware that you're not alone and all of a sudden you become aware that there might be something supernatural that is happening. It's a very common experience for human beings whenever they feel something like this. They want to take off. They want to get out of here. They want to bolt. And so we don't blame these other men here for doing exactly that. The second they begin to have that skin-crawling type hair standing up experience, they leave. But Daniel can't. I don't know why. Maybe his feet are frozen to the ground. Maybe the Lord is going to have his way with Daniel. I suspect that's true. But Daniel stays long enough to look at this supernatural visitor well enough to give us the description that he gives us here in this text. And um, to say it point blank, he is completely overwhelmed. Daniel is reduced to a puddle of goo in the presence of the supernatural visitor here. Okay. Question. What New Testament text does this remind you of? Is anybody thinking something here with me? Okay, transfiguration, yes, definitely. I was actually thinking also of Paul's conversion experience in Acts chapter 9. Isn't that interesting? That you have these other people who are there 
They hear the sound, but they don't see the person. They don't experience what Paul experiences. They're there for it, but it's Paul himself who has this unique, life-changing encounter with Christ in Acts chapter 9. And he too is completely undone, completely reduced to a pile of human quivering terror. And that, by the way, is what we should expect when a person encounters the divine. When a mere mortal encounters something supernatural, it will definitely change you. And it will change you in one of two ways. Either, A, it will harden your heart like Pharaoh, like Pilate, like Herod. If you encounter Christ, that will either harden your heart so that you will be more calloused and more dead and more cold like Pharaoh was. Or it will completely overwhelm you. It will humble you, humiliate you, and transform your entire life. Okay? And if, if you go through the Old Testament and you look at the Theophanies and the Epiphanies and the Christophanies every single time, it's either hardening of the heart or transformation of the life. Just by way of uh, some examples, Abraham at the Oaks of Mamre, Genesis 18. Moses at the Burning Bush, Exodus 3. Jacob wrestling the angel at the Jabbok River in Genesis 32. You know, he never walked the same again after that encounter. He walked with a limp for the rest of his life. Um, Isaiah in the, court, in the throne room scene in, in, scene in Isaiah chapter 6. Elijah at the brook Cherith in 1 Kings chapter 17. Peter, Andrew, James, uh, John by the sea in John 1. Even the centurion at the cross of Christ, the guy who crucified Jesus. What does he say? Surely this is the Son of God. Okay, So you don't walk away from a Christophany or a Theophany or an Epiphany and be the same. You're changed. And so that leads me then to our third consideration here. What in the world does this text mean? Well, let me give a couple of applications and then we're going to come together to the Lord's table. First application, number one. When you truly encounter God, okay, again, whether Epiphany, Theophany, or Christophany, when you truly encounter God, you will be changed. Look at the way Daniel, let's go back to the text. Look at the way Daniel describes his experience here in verse 8. So, I was left alone and I saw this great vision and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed and I retained no strength. And then I heard the sound of his words. And as I heard the sound of his words, three things happened here. I fell on my face in a deep, uh, I fell on my face in deep sleep with my face to the ground. So, okay. So what happens here? First, he becomes weak. He has no strength, he says. That's number one. Secondly, he is fearfully changed as he describes himself, which I, I might think is that fear of the Lord that the writers of scripture often refer to. And then, and then third, this humility, namely, he falls down to the ground with his face on the ground. And that's exactly what ought to be expected when a person encounters the divine. Okay? Um, if a person tells me that they've met Christ, or they've experienced grace, or they know the true and living God, and that same person walks around with their chest puffed and their head swelled, and their, uh, their comportment, arrogance, I have every reason to doubt that person's, the validity of their experience. Okay? Um, when you, if you tell me that you've had a, a divine encounter with Christ in your life, and yet you are the same prideful, arrogant, self-full person, I'm calling cap on that. Do you know what that means to call cap? Teenagers say that. It means I'm calling you out on that. I don't believe you is what that means. If you tell me that you know Christ and yet you walk around like you are an arrogant, self-confident person, narcissistic in the way that you think, full of yourself in the way that you talk, I'm sorry. I don't believe you. People who encounter the true and living God are changed. How are they changed? 
universally by being humbled. Every time. Nobody gets made more prideful by, by knowing Christ. Always being brought low. Look again at the language of what Daniel says he saw. First, garments. Garments of linen. Priestly wear. You're going to be prideful before the true and living God with your stained garments of sin and disrepute? Your, your heinous transgressions against the law of God? You're going, to, you're going to walk pridefully with your stained garments before the one who wears priestly garments? I don't think so. Look at his face. His face is like the sun. Look at his eyes. His eyes are like flaming torches. Do you dare? Can you? Will you? Will you dare stare into his eyes with your pride? No. No, you will not. You won't be able to. You won't be able to look at it. You can't. You won't hold up. Look at his voice, or listen to it, I should say. His voice is like many waters. The sound of his voice, right? The sound of his words were like the sound of a multitude. Are you going to hear his voice and you're going to tell me that you're not going to comply with what he commands of you? You're going to resist the irresistible voice of the, of the Son of God? You are? No way. Um, anybody who truly experiences the grace of the true and living God, epiphany or not, you will be brought low in that moment and you will be a transformed person. When Paul had his encounter in Acts chapter 9, remember the immediate transformation of his entire life. Because what is Paul up to in Acts chapter 9 before he hears the voice of the Son of God? He's persecuting the church. Like he's actively persecuting the church. He hates what they're up to. Like he disdains their purpose. He's going after them to imprison them and to bring them to death. And then and then on the Damascus road, he has this transformative experience of the Son of God, and he's never the same again. From that point forward, Paul becomes this unstoppable missionary evangelist. Okay? Men's Bible study, we've been studying this on our Friday morning men's Bible studies. With Paul, you can beat him, you can stone him, you can punch him, you can flog him. You cannot stop Paul from this point forward. Nothing. You can imprison him, he'll preach to the guards. Why? Because Paul has a truly transformative experience of the true and living Christ. If there's anything we take away from the supernatural visitor here, don't tell me you're the same person you were before you knew Christ. That's impossible. I don't believe it. Okay. Maybe you haven't met him. Maybe that's it. Second, when you are weak, then he is strong. This is Daniel's weakest moment, I think. Even in the lion's den, he's pretty resolved. But here, tired, weary, aged, frustrated, lonely, missing home like crazy. And so Daniel has his breaking point here in Daniel 10. And you know what? You know what's great? Is that like, the lower Daniel goes, the more intense his experience of God's grace is. Like an inverse correlation. The lower you are, the weaker you are, the more you need him, the stronger he is in the moments that you need him. Isn't that cool? Like, so you know the difference between a direct correlation and an inverse correlation, right? Direct correlation, if you go up, he goes up. If you're, if you're, if you're, uh, if you're, well, if A goes up, B goes up in a direct correlative relationship. That's direct correlation, right? But, but with your dependence and your need for God, like the lower you are, the stronger he is. That's why Paul says, when I am weak, then I'm strong. And, and that's what so many of us, we experience in our lives, is that the moment you need the Lord is the very time that he ends up showing up for you in tremendous ways. Now, different ways from Daniel, different ways from Ezekiel, I, I totally grant that. 
But the supernatural visitor is here to comfort him and to soothe him in the very moment he needs it. Now, let's just take a peek, just a peek to next week's text, okay? I don't want to give away everything that we're going to do next week, but, but let's just peek into next week's text, Daniel 10.10. 10. Behold, a hand touched me, and he set me trembling on my hands and my knees. Okay, so he's working his way back up because he was on his face just a moment ago, right? Now he's on his hands and knees, and he said to me, Oh, Daniel, man, greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. I'll tell you what, if Christ tells me that I am a man greatly loved, that's all I ever need for the rest of my life. That's all I ever need for the rest of my life. And that's coming next week, and we're going to get there when we get there. But the third, just to make one more application before the table here. You know, believer, you you have access to heavenly support and comfort. You really do. Now, maybe, um, maybe it still bothers you that I didn't say whether it's Christ or an angel. <laughs> you just want to know, like, what is it? I need to know. Well, I'm not saying it doesn't matter, because it does. It really does. I, there's nothing I would say doesn't matter in the Bible. It all matters. But believer, you have both Christ and the angels, right? At the end of the day, you have angels, Okay, let me ask you this. Do you believe demons are real? I definitely do. I look at the world all around us. I look at the wickedness, the perversions, the malevolence. There are pretty clearly real demonic powers in this world. And actually, next week's passage talks about those demonic powers and how they overlap with the human world. In some ways, okay. I believe in demonic powers, but that's because I have a, a supernatural worldview. I believe what the Bible says. And in as much as I believe that demons are real and they have wicked powers, so also the Bible teaches that there are real angels. And you know what Psalm 91 tells us? That those angels guard and protect his people. And the New Testament confirms that as well, Okay. You may not be aware, like Daniel becomes aware. You may not be able to see into the spiritual realms like some of the prophets do sometimes in the Old Testament, for instance. But that doesn't mean those powers are not real. You may have been really helped in very practical ways and may not even be aware of it. You know, the book of Hebrews says that sometimes we entertain angels unawares. You're not lacking anything that Daniel has here. Whatever angelic support Daniel has, you have in Christ. Because Christ does not withhold his gifts from his people. So so there's that. But you know what else? You have Christ as well. Whether or not this is Christ, you have Christ. Born, incarnate, obedience, suffering, crucified, raised, and ascended to the right hand of the Father. That Christ is yours. And what is he doing for you right now, believer? Interceding before the Father at the right hand of God. There's nothing that Daniel has in Daniel chapter 10, be it angel or Christophany, that you lack. Everything you need, you have in Christ Jesus. And with that being... Hi, everybody. My name is Rob and I am a deacon at Gospel Fellowship PCA. I'm also the sound engineer, the camera guy, and the podcast manager. Thank you so much for listening to today's message. Please come visit us in person. Gospel Fellowship is a Bible-believing church just north of Pittsburgh, and you can find us at gospelfellowshippca.org. See you next time.